Hey there. Aixa 62. Welcome everybody to OT with DA. Yeah. We're a few minutes late. We they, apologize. They can't see me. They can, okay, well, we can go like I'm this. I'm here. You scoot it to where they can see you. All right, welcome everybody. We are, uh, what happened was, is we were running just a little bit late. We'll tell you why that is in a we, moment. We have a really good excuse. We have a good, not a lot late, just a, like three, four minutes late. Um, Stefan. Hey, everybody. Great to see you signing in. Mark. Envy Glass 2 says hi from New Hampshire. Out to chat. James NY7981. Tennessee Quilt Bug. Ooh, did oh, what's that quilts? one? Asingelman. Asingelman. Gerald Wayne. Joy, and joy. Lots of people. Man, it, go, it goes by really fast. Yeah. Okay. Daniel Jean Francois, blast from the Dude, past. Dude, a blast from the past. Hey, Brother Francois, we love you. Yes. Cassandra says, hi, everyone. Happy Sabbath, at least in New York City. See, look, Naomi Hanbury says, good morning. Hi, Naomi. Hi, Avery. Do you know Avery? We're friends on Instagram. Yeah, she's, she's cool. She's very cool. Cool family. Um, let's see. Hi, Cookie. Oh, maybe hi, you're Sarah. greeting somebody else. Shabbat Shalom. I've found peace, JC. Says hello and happy Sabbath. Mm. Daniel Jean Francois says hello, guys. Mm -hmm. Man, blast from the past. What a what a pleasant surprise. That's right. He was in my Arise class. Yep. NLGP22222 says happy Sabbath. That's a lot of twos. That's a lot of twos. Uh, let's see. Millet T says hi, Elise and David. Stefan says happy Shabbat. Oh, Elisa. Okay. Howdy. I almost called you Elisa yesterday. Well. I'm, I apologize for that. That's okay. I like Elisa. Elisa's a nice name. What else do we have here? Deb, Jenna Grace Pitt says Shabbat Shalom. Tennessee Quilp. Okay. Hey, Stone Doctor, New York City. All right, everybody. Just a few quick announcements, um, especially for those of you that uh, are tuning in live. So tomorrow we are going to do, you either need to push that a little bit that way, Elise, or come closer to me. There we go. Perfect. Now you're in. No, I meant the further away. There we go. Okay. Um, okay there. So tomorrow, Elise and I are going to do a supplemental session. And we're going to be talking. What are we going to be talking about, Elise, tomorrow in our supplemental session? That'll be the first thing that we'll do tomorrow. I'll give you the time. We're going to be moment. talking about animals. And speaking of animals, if you have not heard Dave, David's gobble reel. Yeah. Put it on Instagram today where I am talking to my friends, the turkeys. Yes. Yeah, we were we were talking. We were. I don't know what we were saying, but it seemed really important they to them. They knew. They knew exactly what I was saying. Yeah. Uh, so tomorrow we'll be talking about animals and animal welfare from a biblical perspective. I'm really looking forward to that because this is the area of, this is what you're doing your master's uh, thesis for on? For my master's research project, it's what I've been focusing on, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, so as with... Um, many of our supplemental sessions, what I like to do is just sort of let the other person kind of largely guide the conversation, but I'll be there to interact and ask questions and give my two cents every now and then. But I, I can't wait to see will what you, you have to share. Will you gobble for us? I will, will gobble. Will you make the sounds of all the animals I that will I make mentioned? the sounds of the animals that you tell me to make. Okay. I can make a really good elephant sound. Oh. Yeah. I, I, a few sounds I do all right on. Yeah. I can do a good horse sound. Do you have a good pig sound? Pig? Yeah. Yeah, probably I can do You can, can do a practice good... tonight. I'll pra I'll work on all of my animal sounds so that we can have sound effects. So okay. tomorrow at, I think we're going to do it at noon. So noon, we don't normally do midday, but because we have two sessions tomorrow, we have both the supplemental session and the uh, normal chapter that we'll be going through, or two chapters again tomorrow. So tomorrow at noon mountain time, I realize that that won't work for many of you because you'll be in church or the timing's not right. That's Okay. The supplemental session will be archived on Instagram, so you can always come back and watch it. And, of course, it'll be up on my YouTube channel within about 24 hours or less. So that'll be tomorrow at noon. And then tomorrow at, I'm not exactly sure what time, but probably a little earlier than earlier than 7, maybe 5 or 6. So we'll have a couple hours of downtime, and then we'll come back for our two chapters tomorrow night, which will be, I guess, chapters 42 and 43, because tonight we're at chapters 40 and 41. So big day tonight, between tonight and tomorrow, we're going to have a lot to cover. And Elise, you're, you can only be here a short time. So we're going to, we're going to get our money's worth. 
Full meal deal. Full meal deal. And then Nathan Renner mm -hmm. arrives tomorrow night. He won't be a he won't be a part of our program tomorrow night tomorrow night, but he arrives tomorrow night and then he will be with us the next day. So we get Elise tonight and tomorrow, and then we get Nathan for like three or four days after that. So Elise, mm -hmm. are you ready for tonight? So ready. Two chapters. Two chapters tonight. Chapter 40 and 41, Nebuchadnezzar's Dream and In the Fiery Furnace. Yes. Okay, I'm going to open with prayer and then you'll close. Okay. Sound good? Welcome, everybody. We are so glad you are here. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, as we go now to these two important chapters, Daniel chapter 2 and 3, these are amazing chapters, not only for their prophetic significance, but because they're so inspirational, so encouraging, and so timely. So, Father, give us tonight um, insight, give us good conversation, give us your spirit, and may we come away with a better understanding of you, of ourselves, of the world around us, of the times in which we are living, and we anticipate your presence with us, for we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, everybody, we're going to be in Prophets and Kings chapter 40, <coughs> which means we are well and truly two-thirds of the way through, yeah. our because there's 60 chapters. Mm -hmm. So Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and this is a story that is really, um, well, this is based on Daniel chapter 2, which is a story that's very near and dear to my heart because Daniel chapter 2 and the prophecy that's described there played an enormous role in my personal mm -hmm. conversion. Changed your life. Changed my life. So we'll talk about that when it comes up, but let's just kind of get right into this. And Elise, I'll put you on the spot and have you just read that first paragraph. Okay. Okay. Soon after Daniel and his companions entered the service of the king of Babylon, events occurred that revealed to an idolatrous nation the power and faithfulness of the God of Israel. Nebuchadnezzar had a remarkable dream by which his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. But although the king's mind was deeply impressed, he found it impossible when he awoke to recall the particulars. Don't you hate that? You can't remember your dream. That's not that doesn't happen to me very often. Oh really? You no, remember? no, I remember my dreams. Oh, nice. I've never I mean I shouldn't say never. I've rarely had an actual Nebuchadnezzar type experience. Rarely, rarely have you been revealed. <laughs> no, no. Rarely history. do I have dreams where it's I know it's important or it feels like it was important or consequential, but I can't remember it. Yeah. Okay. Do you dream? Uh I do. How so, many nights in ten would you dream? Mm. Maybe two or three okay, that so I can remember. I would probably huh. dream 10. Wow. Between nine and 10. Every night when I go to bed, it's like, what's on the movies tonight? Nice. Like good, good dreams. Oh. Plots and plot development. And anyway, I could spend a long time talking about, do you know what lucid dreaming is? I have heard of it. Can you do it? Um, I like where you can control what happens in your dream. I used to be able, when I was having a nightmare, to, to say, to recognize that it was a nightmare. And I would hit myself until I woke up, which was, oh, really? was amazing. I would just say, this isn't quite rational. Maybe I'm not conscious. And then I would wake <laughs> myself up by by just hitting myself. And I can't do it anymore. I, I'm stuck in the nightmare. I can't realize it's really? a nightmare. I don't know what changed. When I was a boy, I, I don't tell a lot of people this, but when I was a child, I had the most debilitating nightmares. I mean, just really? terrifying, couldn't sleep. And in fact, it was so bad that my mom, who was like a... Pentecostal Baptist at the time, she brought the church over, like 20 church members came over and tried to cast the demon out of me. Oh, snap. That's a thing. That's an actual thing that happened to me when I was like five or six years old. Wow. It's crazy. So I've had nightmares my whole life, and now I get them probably, I probably have two nightmares a year. Wow. Do you have more or less than that? More. More? Yeah. Like more than one a month? But sometimes a nightmare isn't so bad because... When you wake up, you realize that it wasn't true. It wasn't and then true. You feel more grateful. <laughs> um, yeah, like there were. Uh, yeah, this is a phenomenon. Like uh, they did research on. Uh, I can't remember which island in Hawaii where there was that false bomb threat. Oh yeah, people freaked out. Is they got the text? This is not a test. And then they, you know, it was all a mistake. And they did some testing on people and their their levels of happiness and gratitude after that were a lot higher. Increased. Yeah, because they realized, you know, that they had taken regular life for granted. For granted. So sometimes when I wake up from a nightmare, I'm mm. like, oh, I like my life. Versus if you wake up and something amazing <laughs> happens and you're like, oh, no, it didn't really happen. Um, th th since I've been able to do this kind of lucid dreaming thing where you can kind of control what happens in your dreams. Uh-huh. 
Now, when I start to have a nightmare, true story, I actually like them. Oh. Because I can just like, I can just become the hero. I can kick butt. I can turn around. I can just make decisions. Oh, nice. I think it was like a sort of a, I don't know, like a survival tool that I learned as a child because I would have such debilitating nightmares. I had to. Wow. So anyway, Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream, but I mean, it's kind of nightmare-ish. Like he senses that there's a portent, there's a significance, but he can't remember. And my favorite part about this opening paragraph is that, is that this is an opportunity, she says, for the idolatrous nation and the king to see the power and faithfulness of the God of Israel. Mm. Because here again, God is always on his evangelistic plan. The goal is always to expose those people, everybody, the world, including pagan kings, to the good news of who God actually is. And that's going to come up here. It's one of my favorite things about the whole chapter. All right. Um, The next paragraph, it says, In his perplexity, Nebuchadnezzar assembled his wise men, the Egyptians, the astrologers, magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and besought their help. I've had a dream, he said, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. With this statement of his perplexity, he requested them to reveal to him that which would bring relief to his mind. Um, To this, the wise men responded, O king, live forever. You know, there's the sort of, you know, court-like flattery. Yeah. Tell your servants the dream and we will give the interpretation. Now, I'm going to have you read that next paragraph because there are several really funny words in that paragraph. Dissatisfied with their evasive answer and suspicious because despite their pretentious claims to reveal the secrets of men, they nevertheless seemed unwilling to grant him help. The king commanded his wise men with promises of wealth and honor on the one hand and threats of death on the other well, there you go. to tell him not only the interpretation of the dream, but the dream itself. My decision is firm, he said. If you do not make known t- the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Okay, well, this is a very fairly binary choice, right? Like you're going to get great honor or get cut up in pieces. So which, which is it? I need to know the dream. I need to know what it means. But I love the the use of the words evasive, suspicious, pretentious. Like it's all, in other words, Nebuchadnezzar realizes effectively that he has a bunch of phonies on the mm-hmm. divine payroll, right? Mm-hmm. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You guys, I pay you to know things that I don't know, to have access to information that I don't have access to. And now I really need you to come through. Right. And you're not, and I'm not going to fall for this sort of, you know, sleight of hand here where I tell you the dream and you make up some concocted imaginary. No, I need to know the dream itself. Mm -hmm. And this is so brilliant of God because what God is going to do here, unlike the situation with Pharaoh and Joseph, right? What God is going to do is going to withhold not just the meaning of the dream, but the dream itself. Mm -hmm. So that when Daniel comes through with the dream, then he can have total confidence. And it's not just, you know, Daniel's word versus the, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. the the various uh, uh, wise men in the Babylonian court. Okay, now we're going to skip ahead a little bit because we need to kind of get to the meat of it. Um, So how about jump down to the paragraph filled with fear for the consequences. This is page 471, 493 of the original. Filled with fear for the consequences of their failure, the magicians endeavored to show the king that his request was unreasonable and his test beyond that which had ever been required of any man. (laughs) There is not a man on earth, they remonstrated, who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Okay. So this is the setup, right? Yeah. Only God knows the answer, or the gods know the answers, and they're not here. Yeah. Okay, so it's it's like it's ready-made for God to show up. Yeah. I love how, I mean, reading this chapter, the next chapter, Nebuchadnezzar's kind of like um, an overgrown toddler in a way. <laughs> He's okay, like, explain I, that. Like, I poor impulse control, <laughs> yeah, entitled. I want what I want when I want it. Like the toddler throwing a tantrum in the grocery store. Yeah. You know, you can't reason with, oh, they're trying to reason with him. This doesn't make sense, you know? But God knew that when he um, Correct. let this all play out. And he knew that the fact that Nebuchadnezzar responded so poorly or so uncompassionately actually set the stage so that God could be honored in, in a really big Correct. way. Correct. Yeah. I mean, he, he was a king. He was an ancient king. And kings were accustomed to getting, like you say, what they want when they wanted. Yeah. 
So he wants what he wants and he wants it now. Yeah. And, you know, if if there are such thing as wise men and people that claim to have supernatural insight, it, right. it is somewhat reasonable to expect that totally. some, someone should know. That's that's my point about how he's now realizing that he has these effectively phonies on the divine payroll. And he's like, if, if you can't do what I need you to do, then I'm going to cut you into little pieces, right? Like that's a bit. But anyway, this is the ancient world. It's not the right. world we live in now. So then now Daniel and his companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are numbered among the wise men because they have completed this, you know, requisite Babylonian education that we uh -huh. talked about yesterday. So this guy, Ariok, shows up, knocks on Daniel's door and says, hey, Daniel, I'm, you know, I guess I'm here to kill you or just to let you know that you're going to be killed. And then Daniel, you can imagine what that conversation would have been like, basically says, what's going on? The... The guy, Arioch, then discloses to Daniel, well, this is what's happened, because he says, hey, why is the decree so hasty? Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. What's going on? And then Daniel courageously goes in, I'm at the top of page 472, upon hearing this, Daniel, taking his life in his hands, ventured into the king's presence and begged that time might be granted that he might petition his God to reveal to him the dream and its interpretation. I love this because Daniel here goes out on a limb. He basically says, I mean, at this point, you could say he has nothing to lose. Right. Because if he's going to die, if he does nothing, and he goes and says, hey, give me some time, even if he doesn't come through, mm -hmm. it's the same net result. He's he's going to die. But his confidence comes before the revelation of the dream. Correct. And God doesn't say, oh, I'll tell you the dream. Go talk to the king. He just knows God is so good and so yes. loving, and I'm in this position, and he, Correct. he expected God to help him. Yeah, I love that. In fact, she actually teases that out in the next... Um, I, I actually love this. In the next paragraph, it says, to this request, the monarch acceded. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known, that is to say Nebuchadnezzar's decision, known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. And here again, we're seeing that these, these guys stick together. Yeah. They're close. Together they sought for wisdom from the source of light and knowledge. Their faith was strong in the consciousness that God had placed them where they were and they were doing his work and meeting the demands of duty. I like that. Yeah. I, I like the idea that they're like, no, wait a minute. God did not lead us here under these circumstances, these situations. He didn't give us the breakthrough that we had with the food and the king's table. He's not blessed us to get us to this point only to let us die. That's That cannot possibly be what God is doing. So they have this confidence that God has been leading. And if God has been leading, he didn't lead them there just to die an ignominious death. Mm -hmm. Right? So it says, in times of perplexity and danger, they had always turned to him for guidance and protection, and he had proved an ever-present help. Now, with contrition of heart, they submitted themselves anew to the judge of the earth, pleading that he would grant them deliverance in this time of their special need, mm. and they did not plead in vain. The God whom they had honored now honored them. That's what mm -hmm. we talked about yesterday, yeah. right? 1 Samuel 2.30, him that honors me, mm -hmm. I will honor the Spirit of the Lord rested upon them, and Daniel, in a night vision, was revealed the king's dream and its meaning. So clearly, this is their custom. Mm -hmm. That This would not have been, the food and the dream would not have been the only opportunities for Satan to try to interfere or interfere and God to intervene in the years that they spent in Babylonian ed education. Right. That the, These are, this is not an exhaustive telling of all the things that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, but... We get the feel here that this was their custom. Mm. When they came into a time of difficulty, when they came into a situation where they needed a breakthrough, mm -hmm. they reached out to God. Mm -hmm. They're like, hey, we need you to come through here. And God comes through in a really big way. And basically, she's quoting here Psalm 46.1. She doesn't expressly quote it, but God is a very present help in times of trouble. Mm -hmm. I love also how she said... Daniel's first act was to thank God. Yes. I feel like my first act would be to jump out of bed and run to the palace. <laughs> like, run to the king and right? say, I've got it. I know it. No, he, he took time God. to thank God. And in the in the thank you, why don't you read that next section for us, Lise? Because in the thank you, we get little hints as to what the nature of the dream is. Sure. Okay. He said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might. 
and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. Mm. Yeah, because you can see in there, changes times and seasons, removes kings and raises up kings, reveals deep and secret things. Like yeah. this has to do with the changing of empires, nations, kings, these sort of seasons or cycles mm -hmm. whereby nations come and go and nations rise and fall. So we're already given a hint in Daniel's Thanksgiving prayer as to what this is about and where this is going. You got anything more there? No. Okay. So then he goes in immediately to Arioch and he's like, hey, don't destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king and I'm going to tell the king the interpretation. Quickly, the officer ushered Daniel in before the king with the words, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. Now, I often in both OT with DA and SC with DA and DA with DA, all of them, when there's a scene that in particular just jumps out at me, I'll just write in the margin, scene, right? Like, what a scene. I wrote like a movie. Like a movie, margin, exactly. Yeah. Why don't you read this for us? Uh, wait, sorry. Just that where? first line, just that behold. Behold the Jewish captive, calm and self-possessed in the presence of the monarch of the world's most powerful empire. In I love it. Yeah. I just love it. Can't you see it in your mind's eye? Everyone's I love freaking it. out. Captive. Yeah. Or excuse me, calm. Self-possessed. Self-possessed. Just standing there, young, with an answer. He knows it's the right answer. It's just, I love it. I, there's so much cinematic mm. drama and intrigue here. Okay, mm -hmm. keep reading, keep reading. In his first words, he disclaimed honor for himself mm -hmm. and exalted God as the source of all wisdom. To the anxious inquiry of the king, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? He replied, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven you. who reveals secrets. Come on now. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Great stuff. There's another indication that this has to do with the time, the passing of time, the rising and falling of nations. I, I love the immediate reflexive deflection. Yeah. Right? Like, I don't know the answer. I didn't go to the libraries and study. Mm -hmm. I didn't think really hard about it. And nobody in your realm can do it either. Yeah. This is a message. This is what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, King, the God of heaven, the one true God of heaven, the God that we serve, the one true God he has sent you a dream and he is the one that is giving you the interpretation. Mm. I'm just the one relaying the message. In fact, Daniel is almost like, you don't want to say inconsequential, but but Daniel is just delivering a message that is from God for Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. And we need to bear that in mind. This is God's message, not to Daniel. No. It's in the book of Daniel and we talk about Daniel, Daniel, Daniel 2, Daniel. This is God's message for a pagan king. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's just so, and he said, but there is a God in heaven, mm -hmm. not gods in heaven, a God in heaven who has told you what's going to happen in the latter days. And then he basically says to him, your dream, Daniel declared, and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. There it is again. Mm -hmm. He who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. Huh? This all has to do with the future and all the indications are that. But as for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I have any wisdom or more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes who make known the interpretation of the king. In other words, all the wise men that you were going to destroy. And then this line, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. Mm. Elise, what do you think is going on there? Like what? There's, there's obviously a lot there. God is giving the king a message so that he can know what's going on in his own heart. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think God is using this cognitive dissonance that the king has been feeling mm. and, and saying through Daniel, I can provide clarity. Yes. Which is really what he wants to do for all of us. Yes. Mm -hmm. I love it. And I love the fact that God is taking a personal interest mm -hmm. in a pagan king. Yeah. God is taking a personal interest in a pagan king. This is so foreign to the, the the hostile, adversarial, militant world of which they would have all been accustomed. Our God conquered your God. Our God beat your God. Our God is stronger than right. your God. We took your furniture. We put it in the house of our God. Okay, wait a minute. This has got that Nineveh feel. Like, why is a prophet from 
from here going to Nineveh to tell, and, and why is why is Naaman being sent to, to Elisha? Like God is reaching out. Mm. There's just so many passages in the Old Testament. We just had a chapter a few chapters ago, which is one of the great chapters, by the way, in all of the Conflict of the Ages series. It's in Prophets and Kings. Mm-hmm. We just had it oh, four or five chapters ago. It's called Hope for the Heathen. Mm. And it's an entire chapter on Ellen White sort of unpacking her theology of God's general revelation and interest in all of them. Mm -hmm. And that there isn't really a them, there's just an us. Mm. And and you see this here, like, can you imagine what must the king have thought, you know, going back to that cinematic, you know, the scene, when, when Daniel says to him, God showed this to me to tell you to save our hide because you're really upset, you're like the mm-hmm. toddler, but also so that you would know what's going on inside of your own heart. Yeah. Can you imagine just <laughs> the look on his face when Daniel starts describing the details of the dream? Oh, I love it, I love it, I love it. Okay, uh, read, us the, read us the dream. Okay. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, A great image. This you. isn't a very great image, but... I tried. It's a replica. I tried. Yeah, thank thank you, Elise, for ordering this. Okay. It arrived barely in time. We, yep. were, we were praying, and it arrived like 30 seconds before we started. <laughs> One of the reasons in. we started late. But yes. here we are. We have the great image. There it is. Yes, we prayed about it at din- dinner. And here it is, the great image. Okay. Um, you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands. Here you can do this. Yeah, and it says Jesus on it. Which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay. It struck the image. It struck the image. (laughs) Oh, wait. And broke them. In pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay. That was pretty good. We didn't even practice that. That's how good it was. Um, okay, then keep reading. This is the dream. This is the dream, confidently declared Daniel, and the king, listening with closest attention to every particular, knew it was the very dream over which he had been so troubled. Thus, his mind was prepared to receive with favor the interpretation. The king of kings was about to communicate great truth to the Babylonian mm, monarch. Come on now. God would reveal that he has power over the kingdoms of the world, power to enthrone and to dethrone kings. Nebuchadnezzar's mind was to be awakened, if possible, to a sense of his responsibility to heaven. The events of the future reaching down to the end of time were to be opened before him. Amazing. Yes. So he relates the dream, relays the dream exactly as Nebuchadnezzar had seen it. And you can just imagine with each detail, you saw, yeah, yeah, that is what I saw. And the mm-hmm. head of gold, yeah, that's right, there was a head of gold. And the chest and arms of silver. And okay, we'll bring our great image yeah, back I out. Yeah, I was missing it. Okay, we're missing it. So so all of this is, and at the end, Daniel says, you know, we, we didn't read this part yet, but when he comes to the end, he says, the dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Mm-hmm. There's no equivocation here. There's none of this sort of mealy-mouthed, evasiveness that we were getting with the wise men. He basically says, you saw an image that was a giant metal man, and the metal man had a head of sil- a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, long legs of iron, and then the feet were made partly of iron and partly of clay. And then the, the stone, some stone, an, a divine stone cut out without hands, strikes the image on the feet and grinds the image up. And then the image is blown away. Mm -hmm. But the stone, the seemingly small stone, inconsequential stone, grows and becomes a mountain and fills the whole earth. Now, that's the dream. But then he gives the interpretation. And why don't you read for us the interpretation, beginning, uh, you, O king, are a king of kings. 
You, O king, are a king of kings, Daniel continued, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. So Nebuchadnezzar's happy. He likes He's very happy. Hey, I'm the head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. So it's basically successive kingdoms. Right. And the kingdoms are decreasing in value in some sense. Ellen White suggests Mm -hmm. a moral sense because you go from gold to silver. These are both precious metals, but silver is worth less than gold. It's it's not as rare. It's it's, uh, not as valuable. Then bronze and then to iron and then finally to dirt. So, So you start with gold at the top and then you end up with dirt. And what we're seeing here is the kind of decline of the nations that would become subs that were subsequent to Babylon. Mm. So Babylon and then another nation, another nation, another nation, and then um that final sort of kingdom is divided. Right? And we'll get to that in just a bit. Um why don't you keep reading? Where was I? Whereas Whereas you saw Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, mm. yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Okay. Uh, Top of the next page. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That's the rock. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Mm, Hallelujah. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Beautiful. So... This is basically one of the most incredible and consequential prophecies in all of Scripture. Mm -hmm. Because what it does is it gives us a very easy to access, easy to understand timeline. And this is what's called an eschatological prophecy, which means a prophecy that begins in the time of the prophet and then extends all the way down to the very end of time. You say, well, how do you know it goes down to the end of time? Well, because remember that the stone that strikes the image grinds up the image, which is to say that these other kingdoms pass away. Babylon passes away and the subsequent kingdoms pass away. And then this kingdom, God's kingdom, grows and becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. So it's an eschatological prophecy. Mm. It's the first of many such eschatological prophecies in the book of Daniel. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Mm. Daniel 8, Daniel 9, Mm. Daniel 10, and 11. And And these prophecies expand on this basic framework and provide more detail about the kingdoms. Exactly right. So you have this very important prophetic principle of repeat and enlarge. So Daniel chapter 7 will will further explicate what's taking place in Daniel 2. And then Daniel 8 and 9 will further explicate what's taking place in Daniel chapter 7. And then Daniel 10 and 11 and, and 12 further explicate that. So you have this... This increase, just like any teacher would do. This is just good, you know, teaching methodology. Mm -hmm. You teach a little bit, then you expand, and then you sort of tack that down, and then you expand, you tack that down, and you expand. Mm -hmm. But at at its most basic level, Daniel chapter 2 is telling the story of the rise and fall of Babylon, and then the next empire, the rise and fall of, she actually names the Medo-Persian Empire. Yeah. It's actually named in here. Um, Then that's followed by the Bronze Kingdom of Greece, or Macedonia, Alexander the Great. Then the long legs of iron will be Rome, which will conquer uh, Greece. And then Rome will be divided, not conquered by a further Mm -hmm. nation. And the division of Rome takes place in AD 476. So we have an incredible sort of picture here of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the division of Rome. Mm -hmm. Just like the foot divides into the toes. Exactly. Yeah, and and Mm -hmm. there's a division there, but there's 
some nations and what we today call divided Rome is like Europe, mm -hmm. right? That's obviously divided into more. I mean, Europe continues to fracture. Mm -hmm. Like when I was growing up, we had Yugoslavia. And now there's like six or seven countries that are where the former Yugoslavia was. There's just more and more. Fra My wife is from Romania, but then there's Moldova mm. that's broken off. And you have all of this, you know, fracturing, 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 fracturing. And some nations are very strong historically. Yeah. And other nations less strong. And multiple people have attempted to unite Europe. Correct. And that's even, it's amazing that that's even prophesied. We're talking some mm -hmm. 600 years before the time of Jesus, this prophecy was given. And it says that they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another. In other words, there will be attempts through military means and marriage means mm -hmm. to try and bring unity to what used to be Rome. And that is largely the history of much of Western Europe. Marry, you know, this king to this queen or this prince to this princess or this duke to this duchess to try and do through family ties and connections mm -hmm. what often couldn't be accomplished with military might. Mm -hmm. But there were some, Napoleon, Hitler, uh, uh, Louis the Fourteenth, Charles V, and others that tried to bring unity. And I, I think you could say more recently, the Soviet Union at some level tried to conquer and certainly Hitler. But today, Europe continues to mm -hmm. be divided. There's a fascinating story. I know you know the story about, uh, what is his first name? Hazel. Mm. Um, he was a soldier in the German army, refused to bear arms. Yep. Um, There's a great uh, book, uh, a, thousand yeah, a Thousand Shall Fall. Shall fall. And towards the end of the war, um, he was able to share the prophecy of Daniel 2 with the officers um, and share... That were leading the German army that he right, was a part of. And he's, he was able to share that he did not think they would win because what this says about Europe not being united. And because of that, they made decisions to save the rations. And um, basically, we're going to plan as if we're, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to win. And because of that, the whole, what do you call it, platoon? Yeah, the, the, the battalion or whatever it was. Men were able to live, basically, or else things would have gone bad. Yeah, that's a remarkable book. If you haven't read that book, get your hands on the book, A Thousand Shall Fall. I think it's by Susie Mundy. Susie Hazel Mundy. Susie Hazel yeah. Mundy. That is, a, that is a book worth reading. And it tells this story. It tells a, a, the whole story, but it tells this story here about, mm -hmm. you just imagine this young German non-combatant is giving this Bible study of mm -hmm. Daniel chapter 2 to his military superiors. They see it in the text and then they arrange. Right. And there was a historian there with them in the camp. And he was like, yeah, this makes sense. <laughs> you just love it. Yeah. You love to see it. Um, okay. So uh, I'm going to jump down here uh, again. Again, I love the fact that Daniel makes the point that the God of heaven has shown you something. Mm. That, that Daniel is basically saying, look, this isn't a message from me. This, yeah. this isn't even about me. In fact, God sent the message in the way that he did so that your wise men and your astrologers would be seen to be, you know, incapable of giving the answer. So I'm just here as the messenger for what God has told me. Mm. God has a message for you, Nebuchadnezzar. God is thinking about you. God values you. And I love the language there. Nebuchadnezzar's mind was to be awakened, if possible, to a sense of his responsibility mm. to heaven, that God held him to account as a leader of men and of women, mm -hmm. which is incredible. Um, so then the king, uh, the king was convinced, we're middle of page 475, the king was convinced of the truth of the interpretation, and in humility and awe, he fell on his face prostrate, which would not have been the kind of thing that an ancient Near Eastern monarch would have done, especially right. not before a captive you know, you. Right. Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets since you could reveal the secret. Nebuchadnezzar revoked the decree for the destruction of the wise men. Their lives were spared because Daniel's connection with the revealer, capital of secrets, capital revealer. And the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. <laughs> Put him in charge of all the phonies, right? Um, also Daniel petitioned the king and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. In other words, he didn't forget his friends, right? Like, mm. like he had, the, the, God has come through in a remarkable way. Daniel is the star. I mean, really Jesus is the star, mm. but as far as everybody in the court was concerned, Daniel was the star, but he didn't forget his friends. Yeah. He, he petitions. He says, Hey, listen, the same God that I worship and serve you need to elevate 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as well. Mm -hmm. And then this is my favorite paragraph. In fact, for those of you that are regular with DA participants, this is an all-time paragraph for me. So I put it on the all-time list, and there's only been about six all-time paragraphs. I, I put the whole chapter, Hope for the Heathen, as an all-time chapter. But to me, this next paragraph is all-time. It's one of the great paragraphs in the whole book. Why don't you read it for us, Elise? I feel like you should read it. You okay, love I'll it read so it. much. I just like the way you read. Uh, it's really oh, great. Okay, well, whatever. You read. In the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires, appear as if dependent on the will and prowess of man. The shaping of events seems, to a great degree, to be determined by his power, ambition, or caprice. But in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside. And we behold, above, behind, and through all the play and counterplay Woo! of human interest and power and passions, the agencies of the all-merciful one, silently, patiently working out the counsels of his own will. That's an incredible paragraph. That's phenomenal. And you know what I love is that in that paragraph, when she refers to God, she, just, she doesn't just say, the agencies of God, silently, patiently working out the counsels of his own will. She calls him what? The all-merciful mm, one. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what an incredible thing. She's talking about the movements and the play and the counterplay and the rise and the fall of nations. And she says, what God gave to Nebuchadnezzar and to Daniel and to those in the court was a pulling back of the curtain so that they could see that even though it looks like this is Nebuchadnezzar and this is Darius and this is Hezekiah and this is Ahaz, that yes, these are agents and they are making decisions, but what's really going on is that God is not compelling or controlling, but he's guiding, yeah. he's orchestrating, he's arranging, because he is the all-merciful mm. one. Oh, I just, oh, I, I just, love it. Yeah, I mean, it lights me up. It's phenomenal how um, people who study, when we study Bible prophecy, we get this glimpse behind the scenes. The yes. curtain is pulled back. Thank you. We get insights that people that have studied history their entire lives Correct. have not gotten. And now that shouldn't make us proud because like Daniel, Correct. we need that humility. This this is a message for the world. This isn't just a message for us. Correct. Um, but what a privilege to have this glimpse into history that Thank many you, people Jesus. don't have. She then quotes Paul in Acts chapter 17. We're going to skip over that because as astonishing as this might seem, the next paragraph, not the next one where she quotes Acts 17, but the one after that is another all-time paragraph. And so it's like only number seven in the whole book. I thought this paragraph was out of this world, especially the latter half of it. So this is the top of page 476. begins, God has made plain. Mm -hmm. Okay, so God has made plain that whosoever will may come into the bond of the covenant. Ezekiel 20, 37. So anybody that wants to come can come. Now listen to this. This next bit here is all-time. In the creation, it was his purpose that the earth should be inhabited by beings whose existence would be a blessing to themselves and to one another and an honor to their creator. And all who will may identify themselves with this purpose. Hmm. Of them it is spoken, this people I have formed for myself, they shall declare my praise. It's incredible. She basically goes all the way back to creation. This is a remarkable thing that she does here theologically. She goes from Daniel chapter 2, this incredible image and what it reveals about the, the, the prophetic history looking forward. And then she says that God gave this message to the king and God gives every single person, this line here is amazing, all who will may identify themselves with this purpose. What purpose? That God's plan always was to have a... a like I've been saying lately, a godly people in a goodly land. Mm. That's that's God's plan. And God is not playing favorites. God is not playing partisan here with only the Jews or only Judah. God is trying to reach a pagan king. Mm. I just love it. I, I just, it just, it literally gives me goosebumps. And when I, when I first heard this, I can remember how old I was, I can remember where I was, I can remember the circumstances under which I good. first... Story time. Okay, so story time. I was at the University of Wyoming. I was studying pre-med. I was taking a very difficult um, sort of physiology class, and then I was teaching an anatomy lab, and I would go to a local coffee shop there. I'm not a big coffee drinker. I wasn't back then either, but I just would like to go to the coffee shop. They had, you know, internet or whatever, and 
because the internet, the internet didn't even exist back then. What am I talking about? <laughs> there was no internet. But <laughs> just total anachronistic there. I rode my horse. I, I, I went rode, over there for the Wi-Fi. <laughs> I, I rode my horse to this coffee shop. And so anyway, the, 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 I'm in there and I'm reading the book, The Great Controversy, mm. which had been given to me in a vegetarian restaurant probably eight months before. The restaurant also did not have Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi did not <laughs> exist. But anyway, so I'm 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 reading. I'm supposed to be reading anatomy and physiology, and, and but I but I can't stop reading this book, The Great Controversy. Mm. And there's a chapter mm. in there where she describes the great prophecy of Daniel, chapter two. And the particular edition of The Great Controversy that I was reading had a little section that described. It wasn't part of the original Great Controversy, but it was like an insert walking through this image. Like it was on the paper. I saw oh, it. I saw the head. I the saw the, the whole thing. It was like a Bible study on Daniel 2. And I remember it was something like this. The coffee shop was filled with, oh, 20 or 30 people, mostly college students sitting there. And I'm going like this. I'm 23 years old. Mm. And I'm going like this. And I'm just looking around the coffee shop. And I'm looking down. And I feel like the secrets of the universe are being opened to me. I'm seeing that the Bible anticipated Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the division of Rome, the attempts to unify Europe, and then the second coming of Jesus. And I'm and I'm looking around, and everybody's got their head in a book, their nose in a book, and I'm thinking, God is talking to me right now. Wow. Like this is a something is happening in this coffee shop right now. And that was, I mean, it was literally one of the most pivotal, crucial inflection points in my whole journey. And I can remember as plain as can be in that coffee shop. I can see it right now in my mind's eye. It's the most incredible thing. Wow. And when I saw this, it changed my life. Literally changed my life. Amen. Amen. So God not only had a message for Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king, he had a message for little old college student, David Asherick, sitting in that coffee shop, reading this amazing story. Mm. Um, top of page 477, there's a great line here. In the history of nations... This is uh, 502 of the original. In the history of nations, the student of God's word may behold the literal fulfillment of divine prophecy. And she basically describes that Daniel's vision and dream, or that Nebuchadnezzar's vision and dream and the interpretation that was given to Daniel was given not only for Nebuchadnezzar, certainly for him, but now through the pages of scripture is given to the whole world and this is a Bible study, Elise, that I've given to literally tens of thousands of people through preaching, mm -hmm. through seminars, through uh, just sitting down person to person, through Arise. This is a Bible study that I've just given over and 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 over again. And it almost never, it, it basically always has, it never ceases to have that <gasps> moment for people that hear it the first time. Yeah. I mean, it just, it's Amazing. Yeah. Because the book of Daniel is written some 600 years before the time of Jesus, and it's going through Babylonian history, then Medo-Persian history, then Greek history, then Roman history, then the division of Rome, which takes place in 476 AD, which is more than a thousand years after this prophecy was given to Daniel, or given to Nebuchadnezzar, and then interpreted by Daniel. I mean, it's just un... Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons that one of the central critiques of the book of Daniel is that these prophecies are too accurate. Mm. Right? So they say it must have been written after the fact. These prophecies could not mm. have been written when they were supposedly written because they're too accurate. But that's uh, assuming that God isn't capable of exactly. communicating prophecies. It assumes an anti-supernatural, uh, it has an anti-supernatural bias mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that there isn't a God and prophecy doesn't exist. And But here we are, right in front of us, the evidence that God knows the future not that he controls it, that's an important distinction, but yeah. that he orchestrates it. Yeah, so I what have you got? A, a kind of just a question, Go. Um, something to talk about. Like this idea of removing kings and raising up kings, you could see how some people with more of a determinist or Calvinist right. perspective would say, yes, uh, God is controlling every single thing. But then, you know, this raises big questions such as why did God allow Hitler to come into power? Why right. did God allow... Um, Mussolini and other people that have committed such, you know, and, and Nebuchadnezzar himself. I mean, he was no. So there seems to be a saints. balance between 
free will and how much God allows. Mm. Uh, and of course, you got into this more with uh, your supplemental session um, session with John Peckham. Correct. But like, what would you say to someone's like, I really don't like this idea of God being behind earthly rulers. What about this atrocity? Yeah, I just make the distinction that I just made a moment ago that the whole canon of Scripture, the whole revelation of Scripture shows that God is not micromanaging mm -hmm. in the controlling or compelling sense, but he is guiding, orchestrating, little inflection points and occurrences that will eventually create outcomes, but people are still free. Mm -hmm. People are free to make the decisions that they make. They're free to do what they do, but God as the great coordinator, the great orchestra, the symphony conductor, he is without a violation, without a material violation of anyone's free will, at least not in an eternally consequential sense, he is still steering and guiding history in a certain direction, mm -hmm. but in such a way that he never completely um, eclipses the free will of those that are participants mm -hmm. in what's taking place. And you say, I don't understand that. Well, I don't either, but God has the resources of omnipotence and omniscience. And we know that number one, he values free will. And number two, that as Daniel says here, he removes kings, he sets up kings, he's steering, he's guiding. But again, always in ways that are in keeping with the agency, mm -hmm. the respect of the agency for those that are involved. Mm. So, so that so that none of these tyrants, none of these people that you've described here, Mussolini, Hitler, or others, are traceable to God or to his action or his intervention. Mm -hmm. Now, those people became who they became and did the things they did as a consequence of their own choices and the choices of the enablers around them. Mm -hmm. You feel that? I feel it. Do you it. like that answer? Do you want to add anything to it? No, I like it. I mean, it's like um, a microcosm of this principle would be found in the story of Joseph. God Correct. didn't um, inspire the brothers to um, s sell him or you know, abandon him. Right. He didn't want Joseph to be sold into slavery. He didn't want Joseph to be falsely accused of sexual assault. But yet God moves in the situation so much so that by the end of the story, you're almost like, wait, was all of this supposed to happen? Well, no, not all of it was supposed to happen. But God is so creative and so exactly. sovereign that he's able to work around a situation to that extent. The illustration that I've used before is of like a master musician mm. who who you're playing something and then you play what sounds like a wrong note, but a master musician can take even a wrong note and just boom, boom, play yeah. another chord and then all of a sudden we're modulating. Mm, that's good. And then, da, 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 and then they're playing and then somebody plays a wrong note and he can steer the the composition in such a way that even when wrong notes are played, that were not the notes that would have been desired by him, he can still, you know, this is what this is what Joseph says to his brothers. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Remember when he reveals himself mm -hmm. to his brothers, he said, the thing you did, you meant evil, but God superintended what you did. He overruled right. it. Although certainly we can say some things just were purely evil and never, ever, ever should have happened. No, of course. But also, you know... But, but what God uses is not the same as what he chooses. Right, and it's easy to say, oh, why did God allow Hitler to come into power? Well, God also allowed Hitler to come out of power. Like, Correct. There, there could have been much more human suffering throughout human history than we have seen, mm. even though we've seen a lot. Um, so God has worked... Yeah, sometimes we're comparing it to the wrong thing. Yeah, we don't live in a morally perfect or morally optimal world, but we also don't live in a world in which there is maximal human pain and suffering. There right. could be a lot more pain, a lot more suffering, a lot more oppression, and a lot more cruelty. So what God is doing is he's navigating through, always trying to steer people, nations, individuals, families, communities, neighborhoods, whatever, toward the best possible outcome. But when that doesn't happen, he's always trying to insulate. We were just talking about this the other day before you got here, Elise. Like when God is giving his counsel to Judah through Jeremiah, he's saying, cooperate with the Babylonians, cooperate with the Babylonians, cooperate with the Babylonians. You're going to be there for 70 years. Pray for the peace of the city, plant your gardens. For those that are carried away captive, settle in, pray for the peace of the city. Mm. For those of you that remain here, don't stir the pot. Don't rebel. No insurrection and your city won't be destroyed, and your temple. So here's the point. God is saying a punishment is coming. It's unavoidable at this point. It's going to last 70 years, but you can still modulate the severity of it, mm -hmm. and then they rebelled against that. So then now God has to go pick up the pieces, and like he's always running out ahead to try and protect us from the full force of the consequences of our own bad choices. Mm. And so while even there are, yes, certainly periods of incredible, intense human suffering and pain. The Holocaust is a good example. 
There were lots of people that died in the Holocaust and many more could have died, mm -hmm. right? So God is always working in, and if you want to do some reading on this, I mean, there's a lot of great reading. Obviously, we're going to get to the book, The Great Controversy, eventually, but Gregory Boyd has done some great work on this. He's a theologian. Don, John Peckham, in his book that I've recommended a million times, The um, Theodicy of Love, where you have the sovereign God who was always working with, through, sometimes around mm -hmm. human agency, but never to the degree that he's completely superintending or overriding agency in a deterministic fashion, mm -hmm. like you were suggesting, mm -hmm. you know, some belief. Okay, this is an incredible chapter. We absolutely love it, but we've got to get to our rubric and then our word. Okay. So um, did you get the right rubric this time? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, Elise, for you, what was the point of this amazing chapter? The future is safe in God's hands. The only kingdom that will last is God's kingdom of love. I love that the future is safe in God's hands. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I put the point is to tell the story of one of the greatest prophecies in all the Bible. I love Daniel too because it played an enormous role in my personal conversion to Christ. Mm. Mm. Okay, the person, what do we learn about God here that we might not otherwise know? God knows the future and reveals to his children as much as we need to know. Ooh, I like that. Only as much as we need to know to have confidence in his leading. Mm -hmm. What'd you put? I just put the, the passage here in Daniel 2, right? That This is what we learn about God. Praise be the name of God forever and ever. This is beginning in verse 20. For wisdom and power are his. He changes the times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in the darkness mm. and the light dwells in him. Uh, this is what we learn about God. And, and I also put that God loves and reaches out to pagan kings. Mm -hmm. Whoo! Come on now. How do we pray this chapter? I put God help me to trust you with my future. Beautiful. So simple. So succinct. God help me to believe and know that you reign supreme over the universe Help me to live this way more and more, mm, mm -hmm. right? That God doesn't just know the cosmic future, but like Elise said, God knows your future. He has a plan. We, we quoted Jeremiah 29 just the other day. I know the thoughts that I have for you, God mm -hmm. says. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and you a hope. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. 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 Okay. Uh, practice. How do we practice this chapter? Oh, I put that one practice is paying attention to Bible prophecy, studying Bible prophecy. Great. Great. Very good. To live in the light of Bible prophecy. Mm -hmm. I put kneel before God, stand before anyone. Mm. Right? Because they went and they knelt and they, and yeah. he could stand before that king because he had knelt before the king of kings. Mm -hmm. Kneel before God, stand before anyone. Elise, let me just guess what your promise is. I'm going to guess that your <laughs> promise, <laughs> Jeremiah 29. Did God reveal this to you in a dream? God revealed this to me miraculously. What's your promise? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Amen. And then my uh, promise was Daniel 2.44. Um, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be mm. destroyed, nor, it will be, nor will it be left <laughs> to another people it will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it's it, but will itself endure forever. Boom. Boom. Jesus is King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Everybody, what was your word? What was your word? And then we're going to get to our next chapter. I told you that tonight would be a little bit of a long one. We're going to have to hustle through Daniel okay. chapter three. Um, I'm excited about my word for this chapter, and I'm thrilled about my word for the next chapter. I'm oh. even more thrilled about my word. Okay, I can't wait to hear it. Wisdom, revealer, kingdom, reveal. Stone. Stone. Mm. Great word, Secrets. Ruben. Secrets. Curtain. That's my word, curtain. Revealer. Revealed. Revealer. Source. Ah, that's a good one, too. A lot of source. Mm. Reveals. Given. Vouch safe. Oh, yeah, that's a great. I love that word, Stefan. Almost nobody uses that Bring word it anymore. Bring back. Uh, Connection. Sought, source, secrets, dream, understand, we, we should give them revealer. A there he is. Determined. Some standing on the world. 
Providence's counterplay. Oh, very good. That's in that great uh, paragraph, the all-time paragraph. And so is the word curtain. David, your word for chapter 37. Oh, I, I went with hidden. I went with hidden. Sorry, I forgot to announce that. I'll talk more about that maybe Watcher, tomorrow or the next day. Understanding. My word is king. Oh, very Ooh, good, good 303 one, good Syzygy. One. Very good. Revelation, says Stefan. So he does vouch safe. Revelation. Uh -huh. Stone, says Richard. Revelation, says Victor Mills. Very good. Uh, counterplay and curtain, Stefan says, is good. Yeah, I love the word curtain. Yeah. Right? The, 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 she says it there in that classic paragraph, that all-time paragraph. But in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside. You are always excited about your word, says Gerald Wayne. That is only mostly true. My word for the next chapter is an 11 out of 10. I cannot wait. I'm giddy about it. Um, so what was your word for this one? My word was not actually in the chapter, but I picked meta narrative. Oh, okay. I, I like it. Daniel too. It's meta narrative is the big story, the big story, story behind the story, behind the curtain. And God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to understand his story in the context of the meta narrative. And he wants us to understand our stories in that context. Meta narrative is exactly the kind of word that a burgeoning theologian would choose. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> that, that, the, the person that I know that uses the word meta narrative the most of all the people that I know and love is Nathan Renner, who will be here oh. tomorrow. Oh, man. He just, he just, for there was a period there where it was just like every conversation I would so, have with him, he'd be like, so the meta narrative. <laughs> a fancy way of saying the big story. The big story. Meta narrative just means big story. Um, all right. Uh, somebody just asked me what my word was for chapter 36. Uh, let me double check. Chapter 36 was honor. Honor. Okay, everybody. Uh, we've got to kind of hustle to our next chapter, which is chapter 41, The Fiery Furnace. And this is a story, and maybe this one, we don't normally do this, but this is a story that we know really well. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you don't mind, Elise, what if I put you right on the spot? Okay. And you, oh, you want to read from your mic? Oh, no, I can read from yours. From the micro font. <laughs> so what we're going to do here for, now we're moving into the next uh, chapter, Daniel chapter three. <coughs> and this is such a great story and it reads so well. Yes. If, if you would just read until you get tired of reading and then okay. I'll read, but mm -hmm. read the whole thing if you want. Daniel chapter three. Okay. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. 60 cubits high and six cubits wide. A little bigger than the one that we have here. I think that's like 90 feet yeah, wide. Yeah, it's almost 100 feet. And set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other All the big wigs. Officials. You know what they would say in Australia? The mucky mucks. The mucky mucks. Have you heard that before? No. Is that all the mucky mucks? <laughs> to, that's funny. To come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, <laughs> advisors, treasurers, judges, the mucky magistrates, mucks. and mucky mucks assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Mm. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, trumpet sound, please. <laughs> Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Hmm. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you. 
Hmm. your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. You want to read? Okay, sure. Furious. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abed. Oh, I get to read the best part. I get to read the best part. And Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? You can almost hear the incredulity in his voice, right? Like, you're my people. You know, I've, I've promoted you. What's going on here? Think of all I've done Think for Think of all that I've done for you. That you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up. Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, uh, lyre, harp, pipe, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? This is this is a setup just like chapter two. Yeah. What were you going to say? Oh, it's just so ironic. What kind of God would be able to rescue <laughs> it's you? It's such a setup. And it's a little bit like the setup in chapter two, right? Where they're like, no one knows this dream. No one can do this except yeah. the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Uh, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. So polite. But uh, firm. But firm. But yes. firm. But your majesty, we just want you to know. Yeah. You know, this is, we understand. You you have, hey, you have your policies. We have right. ours. They're not throwing a fit. Hey, yeah. It, you, you do you. We're going to do us. Um, <laughs> Kings, what, what did you call him earlier? When you said the king was a... Overgrown toddler. Oh, an overgrown toddler. Watch this. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious. With Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mm. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Took care of those rebels. Like, got them. Got them. Anybody else want to not bow down to my monumentally large gold image? But what? King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, your majesty. Mm. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. Ooh, I like that. Unbound and unharmed. Mm. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Or New King James, the, the son, son of, God. of God. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. Wow, he is really fickle, isn't he? Servants of the Most High God. He just immediately reverts back. It's like his memory comes to him. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, the mucky mucks, uh, and the royal advisors all crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was even no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, here we are, be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province mm. of Babylon. He still didn't Woo! have the whole religious liberty thing Yeah, he, the religious liberty thing he didn't quite have sorted out, but what a story. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is one of the great answers in all of scripture. I love it. Yeah. Hey, Nebuchadnezzar, um, you don't need to give us a second try here, a second yeah. chance, because our God is able to deliver us, and he might. In fact, we believe he will. Yeah. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to your silly image, so you do what you have to do. Yeah. Have you seen the film Inside Out? I have. Okay, you know the, yeah, the, the, the animated, anger, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the anger, anger yeah, character, yeah. and it, it, the fire comes out of his head? <laughs> yeah. That's what I thought of when I was reading about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Just like, <laughs> yeah. blows his top. And it's just so fascinating how um, there's a lesson here, too, in memory, 
because, you know, he went from being humbled in Daniel chapter two, wow, God revealed this dream, to, oh, I liked being the head of gold, to, oh, I don't want God to have anything to do Correct. with this, you know? And it's so important for us to remember the lessons God has taught us or else. Um, well, I think one of the most important paragraphs is on page 481. Okay. And Ellen White drives at exactly the point where you did it. You got it. Boom, boom, boom. Right. Okay, read it for us. This is a paragraph that begins, the thought of establishing. The thought of establishing the empire and a dynasty that should endure forever appealed very strongly to the mighty ruler before whose arms the nation of earth had been unable to stand. With an enthusiasm born of boundless ambition and selfish pride, he entered into council with his wise men as to how to bring this about. Forgetting the remarkable providences connected with the dream of the great image, forgetting also that the God of Israel through his servant Daniel had been had made plain the significance of the image and that in connection with this interpretation, the great men of the realm had been saved an ignominious death, forgetting all except their desire to establish their own power and supremacy, the king and his counselors of state determined that by every means possible, they would endeavor to exalt Babylon as supreme and worthy of universal allegiance. There was a lot of forgetting. That's a lot of forgetting. Dementia. And then look at the next paragraph. The symbolic representation by which God had revealed to the king and people his purpose for the nations of earth was now to be made to serve for the glorification of human power. Daniel's interpretation was to be rejected and forgotten. Forgotten. Truth was to be misinterpreted and misapplied. So this is really important here because she's driving at the point you were making just a moment ago. You mentioned that he was humbled in Daniel chapter 2. That's true. You could even make the case that at some level... He was, maybe humbled is the wrong word, but he was amazed in Daniel chapter 1. True. Right? And, and it, even if Nebuchadnezzar himself wasn't aware of the 10-day experiment, certainly, what was his name? Ashpenaz? But, right? The guy that came. Guy. I mean, in other words, Nebuchadnezzar has ample opportunity to see that something is a little amazing and amiss here. Right. Well, in and chapter even one, says this later in the chapter. He could tell that something was different, different. about them. Correct. Exactly correct. Um, what else do you have here? Okay, so one of the things I want to highlight, bottom of page 482, okay. we got the forgetting thing. Yeah. Bottom of page 482, there's a paragraph that begins, the appointed day came. Yeah. This is uh, 506 of the original, and I want to just read the last sentence there where she talks about Satan. She says, Satan had hoped thereby to defeat God's purpose of making the presence of captive Israel in Babylon a means of blessing to all the nations of heathendom. In other words... Here again, Ellen White comes back as she does over and 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 over again. And that is that the point of Israel was never regional and exclusive. It was always global and inclusive. And the and the very first, the introduction to this amazing book is the Vineyard of the Lord. And then you followed by the chapters on Solomon, et cetera, et cetera, where she just makes the point, you know, over and over again that God's plan always was that Israel was supposed to be the means by which the world was enlightened. So even here, I mean, think about this. this is incredible, Elise. The wheels have come off the Israel experiment. Israel's in Assyrian scattering captivity. Judah is now in Babylonian captivity. There's a feeble little remnant still left back. I mean, the whole experiment has gone terribly. You know, you're talking centuries of monarchs of which only a few were any good. And yet still God is holding out hope against hope against hope against hope that in any possible way, Insofar as it's possible, God is trying to get access to everyone. Hmm. I, I just love that that even when plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P has all failed, mm -hmm. God just keeps coming back to his passionate love for the world. Mm -hmm. And Satan's trying to thwart that. I, I, I just, it, it's one of the things I love about it so much is that Ellen, it's such a feature of Ellen White's theology in the Conflict of the Ages series. And it's such a feature of Paul's theology and of New Testament theology, of the gospel writer's theology. And what it does is it helps me to know that Ellen White was grounded in a biblical understanding of how the New Testament writers viewed the Old Testament mm. and the vocation of Israel. In other words, we don't have to shoehorn Ellen White in like, oh, well, you know, the theologians and the scholars and others tell us that this is what's taking place in the Old and the New Testament, and Ellen White saying something totally different. No, she, she is literally note perfect. 
She's pitch perfect as to the sort of overarching theme. I mean, let me just read this section again. This is from our chapter a moment ago, one of my all-time uh, paragraphs, page 476. I'll read it again. In the creation, it was God's purpose that the earth should be inhabited by beings whose existence would be a blessing to themselves and to one another and an honor to their creator. All who will may identify themselves with this purpose. She goes right back to creation. Mm -hmm. And the Abrahamic promise and covenant was really just to trying to recapture, restore, reimagine creation, which was a godly people in a goodly land. Mm -hmm. So even here, he's trying. And Satan hates that. He hates it. Mm. And he's trying to thwart it. Okay, what do you got? Yeah, one of the things that jumped out to me is um, kind of a lesson on jealousy. Because, okay, okay. like, the wise men owed their lives to Daniel, right? He, he yep, saved them. Yeah, great point, great point. And he was humble about it, right? He he didn't say, oh, I, I told the king and they didn't, right? He said, this wasn't me, this came from God. And yet, they still became jealous, and, and she points out that that jealousy is part of what um, caused them to come up with this plot to, you know, to try to get the king to, to do this. And I think there's this lesson here that... Hmm. When we're That's jealous of other people, and of course, jealousy can come in many forms. We're jealous of someone's appearance. We're jealous of their, you know, there's professional jealousy. There's being jealous of someone's talent or skill or finances. relationship, finances, whatever. Um, if we're not careful, it can really deceive us in the way we, um, the assumptions we make about other people. Jealousy has kind of a deceptive influence. So we assume the wrong things about people. We see them the wrong way. And rather than having, you know, gratitude towards them mm. or appreciating them in the way that God wants us to, instead we're, you know, maybe even, be, you know, plotting. Hopefully we're not plotting bad yeah. things, but maybe we become a thorn in their flesh. So, yeah, the, the there's a lesson here on contentment mm. and on... Um, kind of celebrating the gifts and contributions of others rather than becoming jealous. One of the things that jealousy does is it puts, it makes us the star of the movie. Mm -hmm. Everything's about us rather than allowing other people's experiences to be as real to them and as important to them as our experiences are to us. Mm. We see people only in their relationship to us. Yeah. Right. So now we're, oh, they have more, they have less, they're not as smart, they're smart, whatever. We, we're the common denominator and we need to get outside of ourselves. Yeah. And we need to see that other people are wonderful. They're beautiful. One of my favorite things about Instagram and social media has a lot of downsides. I mean, we know this now, especially for young um, girls, uh, you know, sort of teenage girls and teenage boys, especially the girls, though. So there are downsides to social media. But here we're, we're on Instagram. We're on social media right now. But one of my favorite things about social media is that it has given us access to see how many incredibly talented people there are in the world. Mm -hmm. Many of the things that I follow on Instagram are like painters, photographers, musicians, artists. And Violet and I are very often, including just tonight, we're just, I'm saying, did you see this? And we just marvel people at how- People are amazing. People are amazing. Yeah. The world is filled with amazing people. Mm -hmm. Intelligent, articulate, uh, uh, creative. Mm -hmm. and, and I look at some of the things that people do and I think, I could never. I just could never do that. It's the I just see some of the things, the things that people build. The, uh, I follow this one guy who is amazing. He actually takes old skateboards and he makes the most beautiful art out of old skateboards. Wow. It's it's just, and yeah. that's just one example. There's I follow this other guy. His name is Simon Bull. He's an artist. I love what he does. It, it's just, mm. I love and it. I think one of the most important solutions to jealousy or perhaps envy um, would be a better way of describing it is... Um, really valuing our individuality there you and go. recognizing exactly. God made each one of us to be a completely unique, distinct human being. Correct. There's no such thing as an average brain, an average Thank body. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so when we are more interested in becoming the best versions of ourselves and celebrating other people as they become the best versions of themselves, it can bring a lot of relief to this um, competitive way of thinking. Thank you. Yeah, we need to let God, there's just so many amazing, wonderful, creative, intelligent people in the world. We need to celebrate that. Mm -hmm. We need to celebrate that. Can I read you my favorite paragraph Please. in this? My favorite paragraph in this uh, chapter is on page 484. It looks like it's maybe 509 of the original. Bottom of 484 in the types and symbols. But the Lord. Yes. 
Ooh, I underlined that too. Oh, you did? Look at this, look at this, look at this. Oh, you wrote, you underlined the same thing yeah, I did. I name, love this, I love name. this. But the Lord did not forget his own. This is when they're in the furnace. As his witnesses were cast into the furnace, the Savior revealed himself to them in person. And together they walked in the midst of the fire in the presence of the Lord mm. of heat and cold. Love it. The flames lost their power to consume. The Lord of heat and cold. <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. I love it. Ellen White will often do that where she'll like capitalize the source or she'll capitalize our revealer. Mm. But the, the Lord of heat and cold, I just love that. It's so creative. It's so awesome. It's like they get thrown into the fire and Jesus is like, turns on the AC. Yeah. I was wondering as I was reading this, uh, how warm did they feel? Were, yeah. Were they chilly in there? Like, <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Jesus turned on the AC. They're like, oh, it's nice in here. <laughs> Such that when Nebuchadnezzar invited them to come out. And notice how respectful they were. Yeah. They didn't come out until he was, you know, invited them. Oh, yeah. you know, your majesty, very respectful, very deferential. They're not, in other words, they're not defiant in the obnoxious way that people are today. Yeah. You know, where it's just people hate authority. They hate authority figures. There's no respect for authority. I don't like that. I raised yeah. my sons to respect authority, to respect their teachers, to respect mm. the police, to respect people in authority. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is a value and a virtue that we see in short supply in this day and age. True. I love that. The Lord of heat and cold. What what, what else did you love? Yeah. Um, I loved how, let's see, on page 486, um, let's see, a few paragraphs down. Okay. By the deliverance of his faithful servants, the Lord declared that, and then she lists two things that the Lord was declaring. One, he takes his stand with the oppressed. Come on now. And two, rebukes all earthly powers that rebel against the authority of heaven. So not only was this a lesson about God's supremacy and God's power above other gods, above the image, but also that God intervenes when people are being oppressed and he takes that very seriously, you know, whether they're rescued in that moment or not. God is always mindful of oppression mm. and he cares about that. And then I thought it was interesting as she closes it out, how she actually applies this to God's people living in the end of history. And the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She talks about the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Well, and this, this she's anticipating there and foreshadowing what's coming in the great controversy. Right. GC with DA. GC with DA. It's coming. Probably not. In, well, not in 2024, but maybe 2025. And will you come and join us for that? I hope so. Yeah, okay. Um, I want to read one more thing on 486 that I really loved. And I want to ask you a religious, because you mentioned the point about religious liberty. Okay. How at the end when he's like, this is the one true God. He's the only real God. And if you don't worship him, we're going to cut you into little pieces and turn your house into an ash heap. Yeah, he went from you get thrown in the fire if you do worship him to if you don't worship him, you right. get cut in the So pieces. clearly, you know, he's pendulously swinging and doesn't have our sort of modern sensitivity and sense of religious liberty. But mm -hmm. I do want to ask you a question. Okay. Top of page 486. Everybody join me there. This is 511 of the original. In these, so this is right after he said, there's no other God that can deliver like this and the things that we were just saying. Okay. In these and like words, the king of Babylon endeavored to spread abroad before all the peoples of the earth. His conviction, and, and we're going to run into this tomorrow as well. You know, Daniel chapter four is amazing. Mm-hmm. Daniel chapter, it, it, there's a lot more to come with mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar. Um, that the power and authority of the God of the Hebrews was worthy of supreme adoration. And God was pleased with the effort of the king to show him reverence and to make the royal confession of allegiance as widespread as was the Babylonian realm. Now notice the next paragraph. It was the right thing mm -hmm. for the king to make public confession and to seek to exalt the God of heaven above all other gods. But endeavoring to force his subjects to make a similar confession of faith, and to show similar reverence, Nebuchadnezzar was exceeding his right as a temporal sovereign. He had no more right, either civil or moral, to threaten men with death for not worshiping God than he had to make the decree consigning to the flames all who refused to worship the golden image. God never compels the obedience of man. He leaves all free to choose whom they will serve. Mm -hmm. Now, here's my question. Living as we do, many of us in... Well, we all live in the modern world, but many of us live in first world countries where the principles of religious liberty and civil liberty and sort of Western civilization are front and center, right? And principles of religious liberty, such as the separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, there have been controversies even, you know, recently about placing the Ten Commandments in a courtroom, placing the Ten Commandments in mm-hmm. a, a, legis- a state legislative hall, whatever it might be. M- my question is this. I do see a distinction because right now there's a big concern about religious nationalism or right. Christian nationalism. But I feel like some of this is overshooting the mark. And I want to see what you think about that because the idea, I don't know if you saw the situation that just recently happened with, there was like a, in Iowa, there was like a statue of Satan. Okay. Did you see this? Mm-mm. There was like a statue of Satan, uh, you know, whatever, some satanic statue that was set up because of religious liberty. Right. And then some guy went in there and he tore it down and now he's being charged with a hate crime, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I understand that we live in a pluralistic society. I understand that we want to avoid Christian nationalism. I understand that we want to avoid the uh, the enforcement of the first tablet of the law, the first four commandments. Right. But she says that God was pleased when Nebuchadnezzar made a public confession of the truthfulness, the 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 the, the, the fact that there was one true God, okay. and that she said he was right to do it. Okay. So so how do we how do we thread that needle today? Because I feel like the pendulum has swung too far the other way. Trying to take God out of the Pledge of Allegiance, setting up like a satanic statue as if that's the equivalent of you a nativity also scene. of this argument that abortion is a satanic ritual, so therefore because of religious liberty, I have heard that. should be honored. It's the most disgusting, perverse thing ever. Because you don't get to kill people. You're not... You're, that, but, but, but okay, right. set the abortion thing over here just okay. for a moment. I, I don't... Okay, we live in at least a culture that is broadly speaking Mm Judeo-Christian. This is not deniable. We don't live, and I might, you know, this this might go to a place that some are uncomfortable with, but I'm going to say it anyway. We live in a nation where there are many millions of people that are Muslim. Right. And they should feel comfortable in our schools. They should feel comfortable that they're represented at the state legislature. They can elect who they want to elect. You know, Mm -hmm. the people can elect, and there are Muslim representatives in the House. I don't know if there is in the Senate or not. Um, but certainly in the in the, in Congress in the House mm-hmm. of Representatives, okay, no problem. But but we're not a Muslim nation. I've been to Muslim nations. Muslim nations are n- not like the United States of America because of the interface, even in moderate Muslim nations, because of the interface between religion and state. The theology is such that there is not a strong sense of disconnection. Which is why, like, you know, a lot of the American sort of foreign policy, you know, since the Iraq war and other wars, where we're just going to go into these Muslim nations and we're going to set up democracies, Mm -hmm. it doesn't take because the way that Islamic theology works is that there is no such thing as the separation of church and state. There's the integration of church and state. So you would, you know, you don't feel comfortable with the Satan statue. Right. Um, What? How would you feel about, for example, a school that displayed the Ten Commandments, but also a statement from the Torah? Or the well, I'm Quran. not even sure about the displaying, but uh-huh. like individual members. Okay, so Nebuchadnezzar here is an individual. Okay. So, so historically, many of our presidents have, you know, at least been ostensibly Christian, mm-hmm. right? Like supposedly Christian. I got no problem with that, mm-hmm. right? I don't. I don't think that our not just our presidents, but our senators, our congressmen, mm-hmm. and others. They can be, okay, you're a Buddhist? Fine, be a Buddhist congressman. And represent your constituency. You're a Christian congressman? Fine. But as a nation, we're not a Buddhist nation. Mm-hmm. We're, a, we're a Judeo-Christian nation that have Buddhists that need to be comfortable and represented, Muslims that need to be comfortable and represented, uh, atheists that need to be comfortable and represented. Mm-hmm. But like when we say, you know, we pledge allegiance and we have in God we trust on our mm-hmm. coins, people are trying to completely... Mm-hmm. D, uh, like in Canada, doesn't there? They completely took that out of out of their money. I can't remember what it says. Maybe it was something some like Canadians. "In God We Trust." Yeah, but they changed it to be very intentional. Um, keep going. No, I'm just wondering. Do, do you have thoughts on this? Because I feel like we're living in a time now where the pendulum has swung too far the other way. In other words, here's the point: mm-hmm. there is a there's not a thin line between. Um, let's say, Christian nationalism and a completely irreligious, amoral, mm-hmm. secular state. That's not a thin line. So there's, there's room in there. 
there's room in there to acknowledge our history. Mm-hmm. You, you can't deny that the United States of America historically and in terms of its essential governing documents is a Judeo-Christian nation. I mean, the, our documents literally say that, that we hold these truths to be self-evident. For example, that we're all endowed with inalienable rights. Mm-hmm. Well, where does that endowment come from? You know, the whole concept of, of democracy as we understand it is that... Human dignity. Th- that, th- that, that it's inherent to mm-hmm. us. And that government is there not to bestow rights, but to protect God-given rights, Mm -hmm. inherent rights, things that are native to us. Mm -hmm. So secularism cannot be the solution here. And I feel like there's plenty of room between total Mm -hmm. secularism and Christian nationalism. And that is just to say, we recognize that we're a Judeo-Christian nation. We're not going to enforce the, like, okay, go back to the abortion issue. Sometimes people will say, no, no, you can't enforce your morality. Well, what, what, what are you talking about? We also have laws that say you can't kill people, right? Manslaughter, first mm-hmm. degree, second degree, third degree mm-hmm. murder. So we enforce morality. You're not allowed to take stuff that's not yours. So we enforce the second tablet of the Ten mm-hmm. Commandments because we understand that all nations need to have some civil structure and laws. Mm-hmm. But the first four commands, we don't enforce them. But I, don't, I think there's a difference between not enforcing them okay. and still acknowledging that this is a nation that historically, and even still to this day, in a majority would affirm there is a God, there are moral standards, you know, et cetera. So I just, right. I'm just talking out loud it, here. But it's I feel interesting. Like... I mean, so many of the principles of the uh, the Constitution come from biblical thinking. Of course they do. Um, and if you take away that uh, worldview, how can you support, uh, or how will we support um, the values that Correct. that we you know espoused so but the, the it's challenging because a lot of times people don't make these connections and Correct. so they they're just taught via the media and whatever that christianity is oppressive and so you know it seems i mean part of it is just a lack of historical knowledge Correct. um that fuels these um efforts to but, yeah, do away and, with everything. And there is a really strong movement right now. Like you're familiar with the work of Yuval Harari, who wrote Sapiens. He's like probably one okay. of the sort of foremost public intellectuals. And, you know, he's into this whole like the United States is just a story that we tell ourselves. Values are stories that we tell ourselves because he's a total, he's a rabid right. atheist. And he basically is arguing for, uh, he's a determinist atheist. Uh-huh. And he's basically saying, these are all stories that we tell ourselves. They're not really substantive or true, but they help us to get along. Okay, I am 100% sure that Yuval Harari could not create governing documents or a nation, and people like him, Mm -hmm. that even approximates the beauty and the the liberty and the goodness, the inherent goodness Mm -hmm. of the United States of America. He could not write with his moral system the Declaration of Independence or the U.S. Constitution or the Bill of Rights. He just couldn't do it. Right. How do you, you know, we're talking about values, we're talking about worth, we're talking about rights, but if human beings are just survival machines, Mm -hmm. if there are no values, if there is no religion, Mm -hmm. if there is no God, if there is no liberty, if all of this are just, you know, these, you know, sort of sophisticated stories that we tell ourselves, good luck. Yeah. Good luck with justice. Good luck with philanthropy. Good luck mm-hmm. with magnanimity. Good luck with life, right? And I feel like the United States is a, you know, fundamentally flawed, and we'll get into this in, in the great controversy, but also at least in concept, mm-hmm. a nation that values I just can't get over this idea that she literally says that God was pleased when Nebuchadnezzar said, there is one true God and I'm going to worship him. Not pleased with the violence, but pleased with the recognition. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Not to make it compulsory. She Mm -hmm. literally says, notice how she holds these two ideas in tension. And I want to challenge our readers. Go back and read those two paragraphs on page 486, 511. The one that begins in these and like words. And then the next paragraph, it was right for the king. She holds in tension. It was fine for him to make a public declaration. Mm -hmm. And God was pleased with the public declaration, but not to enforce. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's great. I I just feel like that is, she's threading the needle there in such a way that she understands that there are things that we can and should and must enforce as a civil society Mm -hmm. and things that we can't. 
You need to have Nick Miller on here for a supplemental I'll bring Nick session. Miller in and we'll, supplemental and we'll, session. we'll have a supplemental we'll session on the nature answers. of religious liberty. Let's do yes. our rubric. Okay. Okay, are you ready? Yes. Yeah, I'm asking you all these religious liberty questions and <laughs> you're like, <laughs> yeah, whatever you say. Um, okay. What was the point, the person, the prayer, the practice, and the promise? What was the point? The point. Our creator is the God of gods and the king of kings. No one is more powerful than him. Woo! God alone deserves our worship. We should trust in his love and protection no matter what. Mm. Hey, he's going to deliver us, we think. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to your silly image. Yep. The person. What do we learn about God? God comforts and defends those who are mistreated for his sake. Oh, I like that. I wrote, God is with us in the fire. That's better. I liked yours. But this isn't a competition. No, it's not a competition. This is about individuality. Correct. God is with us in okay. the fire. How do we pray this chapter, Elise? God, help me to be brave and strong even when I am threatened or mistreated for following you. Oh, beautifully said. Father, strengthen my heart and knees to stand for you in difficult or dangerous times. Mm hmm I remember there was an old C.D. Brooks sermon where he said that God strengthened their knees. You know, he, uh -huh. he strengthened their knees. They weren't going to bow down. Because just like we talked about in Daniel 1, how there would have been plausible excuses that could have been made for the eating of the food. Mm -hmm. You know, there's plausible, oh, I'm going to bend over and tie my shoe or or I'm going to do, you know, some yoga stretches. <laughs> like, yeah. There could have been plausible reasons that they could have gone along with. They could have said, well, it's not really a religious ceremony. This is more about, this is like a national, it's, like, it's patriotism. We're supposed to take care of our health. Remember Daniel chapter one, right. fire isn't good for Fire's our not health. good for our health, but God strengthened their knees. Okay, um, how do we practice this practice. chapter? I can train myself to see the bigger picture so I don't become terrified or overwhelmed by the enemies of God. We, we train ourselves to see behind the curtain. Beautiful. That's kind of like your last one too, about how we should learn prophecy and live in the light of it. Yeah. It's like they, even though on the plain of Dura, is that what it's called? Yep. Like the statue is huge. Everyone's just overwhelmed by this. It's like they were plugged into a much larger reality. Thank you. Thank and you. And so they saw this as this image and this king as very small. Um, so we constantly constantly need to be letting God reveal to us, you know, what's big, what's small, where is he at work, or else yes, things that are you. small will become really big in our minds. Yeah, like like there's this giant hundred foot tall image, but in the light of the sort of larger cosmic thing that was taking place in the you know what they were aware of, the image was just like this to them. It was just inconsequential, yeah. even their own lives. Yeah. They're like, look, here's the deal. We're not going to bow down. You can give us as many chances as you want. I love your point about how they, everybody else there thought this was a really big deal. Yeah. I mean, look at this beautiful statue and all the music and all the mucky mucks are there. This is a really big deal. What do you think they did with the image? They melted it down? Made. I have no idea. Hmm. Hopefully Nebuchadnezzar melted it down. and Yeah, that would have been a... I mean, I shouldn't say there should be an addition to the story because this is the Bible. But I was like, <laughs> wouldn't that be cool if it just melted right there? <laughs> they threw it into the fiery furnace or you know, began to dismantle it and throw it in. I put, for practice, I put... Um, and there were many things, and I loved yours, by the way. But I just put, be respectful to those in authority. Mm. In light of Acts 5.29, we ought to obey God rather than man. Okay, mm -hmm. true, but that doesn't give us license to be jerks. Right, just to be, oh, I'm not gonna. I mean, I, I just can't get over how respectful they are. Yeah. And we're gonna see this with Daniel in the lion's den as well, right? Daniel That's is right. respectful, even when he's on the receiving end of an unfair judgment. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's the promise? Oh, Jennifer said maybe the image still is somewhere. Well, that's a giant someone image please buried become, in the. Someone please become an archaeologist and look for this. Go find the image. Okay. Um, the promise. What's your promise? Okay, I put Jesus' words from Matthew 28, 20. Lo, I am with you always, always, even to the end of the age. Especially since we know that something similar is going to happen in the future. Correct. Jesus and promises to be with us. I went a very similar direction, very similar direction, except I just went from the passage that she quotes here, Isaiah 43, 2. 
-hmm. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Yes. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. And I always take this to mean not that every single person will be delivered from death in the first death sense, but mm -hmm. that God will preserve our bodies. And, and you know, you were just quoting Jennifer there a moment ago. You know, Jennifer and I almost died yeah. in Australia. I mean, right. we were we were within a very short time, maybe, I wouldn't say seconds, but like a minute or two of dying, drowning. You saved her, right? Yeah, but then we were both saved. Yeah. I mean, I stayed with her and helped to keep her afloat and wasn't going to leave her, but there is a, I would say 75% chance that even if Jennifer, because you imagine a situation, if she goes down, because she was in total shock. This is the tide, right? This, well, we just got taken out on a rip tide. Okay. We got taken out to the, but if she dies, like if she goes down and I can't find her, yeah, I'm going to be searching for her and I was already tired. And yeah. so I, I could, I was holding onto her. I wouldn't let her go. And she was oh. in total, she was non-responsive, total shock. When she passed through the waters, you were with her. It, but here's well, the point I made about this okay. is, and I don't know if, if Jennifer felt the same way. Let's see. He totally wow. saved me, Jennifer says. But here's the truth. I was quite sure I was going to die. Wow. Quite sure. Um, I have been in many scary situations in rock climbing, but never once in rock climbing have I thought I'm going to die. In this situation, I was virtually certain I was going to die and that Jennifer was going to die. And I... I had peace. Wow. I was I was not terrified. I was just like, so this is how it ends. And I was actually thinking of my what you know what I was thinking of? My sons and my wife. Wow. And I just had peace. These large waves were coming in and And you're Jen trying was, to swim back? Well at that point there was no swimming back. I mean yeah. you just and then we got saved. We got rescued. But well, who rescued you? The the people came from oh. the, the the surf lifesavers saw us. The surf lifesavers saw us and came out and rescued us. I mean, it was incredible. Um, if we had not been rescued, we Jennifer would have certainly died. And I think 90% well, chance I would have died. My life would not be as good. No pancake club. No pancake club. We have a little group. The three of us text together. We call. Why do we call it the pancake club? <laughs> it's a top secret. It's reason. top secret. Um, but anyway, I just love Isaiah 43 too because I lived that. The waters were literally coming over me. And I was like, you know what? The resurrection. It's going to be okay. Wow. Um, okay. Word, word, word. I am I am giddy about my word. Okay. Okay. What's Jennifer say? No, you yelled for them. Yeah, no, I yelled. I definitely yelled. Um, but I was amazed that they heard us. When, when, you, when you described them coming to save you, the image I had was... Uh, Baywatch. Yeah, they're it's running, not like that. They're running up in their red swimsuits. Let's see. Kindness, deliverance. Like no, not like that. Okay. Worship, forgotten, allegiance. Uh, Together. Companion. companion. Oh, I'm going to be, if somebody has my word, I'm going to be so happy because it's such a great word. Uh, what's, worship. Worship. Dedicated. I like the juxtaposition of dedication of the idol and the dedication of, unmoved, yeah, that's very good. Unmoved. That's good. Forgotten. Vindicated. What's that one? Forgotten. But if not, but if oh, not. but if Ooh. not, oh, that's hot. Yeah. But if not, that what a great word. That's word. one word. But if not, a um, see, Stefan always has these words. What is that word? Sedulous, right, right there. Sedulous. Sedulous. What does that mean, Stefan? Wow. Stand, astonished, pompous, respectful, unmoved, allegiance. Hot. <laughs> hot. Great word. <laughs> Act, I have not seen my word yet. I'm giddy. Allegiance. Allegiance. Stan, I haven't seen mine either. Oh, really? What if we have the same epic I word? I don't think we do. Um, You need to advance them a little bit. Oh, no. No, we're fine. Unmoved. I think some versions say notwithstanding. Not yeah, but but if not is if so not. good. Yeah. But if not. But if not. That's a word. Fire. Burn. Oh, hey, Hannah. Hi, Hannah. Burn, Burn firm. My word is power. Nebi thought he had Nebi. the power to destroy the three for not bowing, but Jesus came through with the power not, to save. Come on now. Nebi. Oh, here you go. Sedulous. Okay. 
of a person or action showing dedication or diligence. Oh, thank you. I've never heard that word in my life, or if I have, yeah. I don't remember it. Sedulous. Scorch. Rely. Scorch. Scorch. Oh, that's really good. I love the fact that it even says yeah. detail. Oh, there's my word. That's my word. NLGP two 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 two. My word is fourth. Nice. nice. And there's there's a reason that the, the the word fourth. Okay. The fourth person. Right. And then at the end of the chapter, what does she talk about? There's the more. fourth commandment. Get out of yeah. Town. The fourth. The I fourth. See, I see what you the did fourth. there. fourth. My word is fourth. Okay. Um, what do you got? What's your word? My word is calm. Oh, because great word. Said, where is it? Calmly facing the furnace, they said. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. Yes. Yeah. Calm. That's very good. Use I love contrast calm. Nebuchadnezzar's emotion and anger. I mean, they may have had a little bit of fear, mm. but they were still able to present themselves with calm. Yeah, the fourth, somebody's saying, I love the fourth. Yeah, it's so great. Because there's the fourth person, and then she closes with the fourth commandment. That was really I, good. It's good, huh? Very good. I also really like um, calm is great. Right there, calm, somebody says. I like that. Calm is the perfect word for Elisa. <laughs> I should tell you a little behind the scenes uh, information here. Before uh -oh. we came on tonight, I said, Elise, I need you to turn up your energy. What did I say? 15%. 15%. Just give me, and you did. I did. I think it was the statue. Yeah, I, I, think I told you, him if the statue comes, it will be easier for me. Look at Melody says, so loving having Elise co-host. Elise is great. We, I mean, God is great, but Elise is such a sweetheart. She's such a blessing and we love her. We love her well, a lot. I'm super grateful I got to join and also grateful for how Daniel too impacted your life, Amen. which then impacted my life later and many mm. other people's lives. God is good. Yeah. Okay, so everybody remember tomorrow um, at noon, noon, we'll do our supplemental session. Noon and then mountain time. We'll sort of see how long that goes. It'll probably be about, what, you think an hour and a half? Depends on how many questions you have. Okay, I'll have a lot of and questions. And how many animal sounds. Somebody says, you're a great team. Yes, supplemental session tomorrow at noon. Jennifer says, I love having Elise there. Uh, we love so we're going to talk about there. animal welfare. In fact, tonight at the dinner table, when we were eating my wife's amazing Romanian stuffed peppers, mm -hmm. we began to have the conversation about animal welfare from a biblical perspective. And I was actually thinking to myself, we need to stop so we can just have that conversation live. We, uh. It was only just a short conversation, but I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be great. So that'll be tomorrow. And there's a special surprise. Oh, there's a, a, a surprise that I don't even know about. It's, it's out there. But do I know about it? It's on the floor. Oh, <laughs> but it's a surprise to it's me a as special well. Special surprise. Um, so tomorrow at noon, supplemental session, and then depending on how much time we need, we'll go probably tomorrow at either five or six. We might theoretically go as late as seven tomorrow, starting. But we will let you know tomorrow what time the evening session will be. And tomorrow night is another double, which is chapters forty. What is it? Forty-two. Yeah, 42 and 43. Is that right? Indeed. Indeed. Okay. I love this, the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, Daniel chapter four? Mercy. I love it. I got a funny story to tell you about Daniel chapter, well, funny maybe is the wrong word, but an interesting story about Daniel chapter four. We'll see you all tomorrow. Who opened with prayer? I opened. You did. You close. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being the King of Kings, yes. who knows the future, who reveals um, as much of the future as we need to know. Mm, thank thank you, you for these phenomenal chapters, for uh, the story of the King's Dream mm. and the story of you um, intervening in the fiery furnace. Yes. We know that um, you care about our future and you care about the fires that we pass through. Mm. So I pray that you would give us um, calm and unshakable confidence as you did Daniel and his friends Amen. to know that you are with us, that you will be with us, um, and that following in your pathway, your path is the best possible choice. I pray that you would be with each person here, um, give them good sleep, mm. and thank you so much for each one. I pray that you would help them to know how loved and cared for they are. Amen. And bring us back tomorrow um, to talk about the animals. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen.